Again, Attorney Steve Vondren, civil litigation attorney. We are talking in this video about intentional infliction of emotional distress. This is the tort of outrage. This is a very important um, civil litigation topic and bar exam topic, okay? This is very important that you understand this tort, know how to spot it, know how to find it, and for, for attorneys like us, know how to litigate these cases. So let's talk real quick about the elements required to prove this tort. So without further ado, let's head to the Attorney Steve litigation whiteboard. Okay, let's back this puppy up here. Okay, so we have got on the board here, we are talking about intentional infliction of emotional distress, what some people call the tort of outrage. The tort of outrage, okay? So on your bar exam, on your paralegal exams, legal exams, you are looking for some atrocious conduct, something that somebody's doing to somebody else that makes you go, my God, what have they, what are they doing? Um, that sort of thing. If you spot that and you read those facts closely and you spot that, you're going to score your big points. Let's take a look at the board here, okay? So we have intentional infliction of emotional distress. We have our elements, okay? When you see that atrocious conduct, you're going to spot the issue and you're going to lay down the rule, okay? Here's the rule. The intentional or reckless causing severe mental or emotional distress by extreme and outrageous conduct, by extreme and outrageous conduct. Okay, so let's take a closer look at these elements. Okay, so as with all of your intentional torts, um, this has to be an intentional tort. Intent, we know, is, you talk about on your exam, knowledge with substantial certainty. Knowledge with substantial certainty that you're going to cause this emotional distress, things like fright, hum humiliation, anxiety, trauma, those kinds of things. Knowledge with substantial certainty that you're going to cause that consequence is what's required. Okay, so let's check that off our box. But here's one of the interesting thing about the intentional torts. I think it's the only one where it can actually be reckless as well. So even if you can't get to the high standard of knowledge with substantial certainty, you look too reckless. Can we show that it was reckless, an extreme disregard or an indifference to whether or not this person would suffer emotional distress, the plaintiff? Um, extreme reckless disregard of the rights of others, okay? The, the, the failure to have any, any sense of what's going on here. Um, so reckless. So the tort can be proven by showing intentional or reckless conduct. So you're going to want to look at these on your exam, don't be surprised if they sl slip reckless in there. Why? Everybody can tell intent. You know, the guy slugged the guy in the face with a with a block of salami. Okay, well, there's your battery. There's your your intentional, extreme, and outrageous act. Those kinds of things. But reckless is a little more difficult. So be looking for that. Make sure you're going to talk about that on your exam. Bingo! You got the points, baby. Okay. So um, again, this is one of the torts where you need to intend the consequences. In a lot of your other intentional torts, all you need to do is intend the act. For example, um, a battery. If you pull someone's chair out, all you have to do is intend to do the act. But this is one of those interesting torts, and I think conversion is the other one. You have to intend the consequence. So you actually have to intend to cause this consequence. Fright, humiliation, anxiety. Uh, pain, suffering, all these things, okay? So you have to intend that to happen. That has to be your intent, your result. Um, under this tort, this is also unique in that it does not allow the transferred intent doctrine. So if you remember from your other torts, um, battery, assault, whatever, if you're intending to commit a battery and you commit a false imprisonment, with the intent transfers, okay? Uh, but this is one of those unique torts where the intent does not transfer, so don't get caught up in that. And, and by the way, if you can point that out and see that and highlight that, the transferred intent doctrine does not apply to this specific tort. Bingo! That's points, baby. That's points on your bar exam. That's how you do it. That's how you're going to get to the next level. Okay, and where you can't show intent, we're back, we're still on our first prong. Look to negligent infliction of emotional distress, which is also... A tort. So don't miss out on that one. Get your points for talking about that. Even assuming that you cannot prove intent or recklessness, plaintiff may have a cause of action for negligent 
infliction of emotional distress. However, physical manifestation of the injury may be required. Physical manifestation proving the injury may be required. So that's what you want to talk about. You hammer that on your intentional torts, you got it. Okay, let's go to causation. Uh, this is similar to all other torts. This is similar to everything we do as lawyers. You have to prove the wrongdoer caused the damages, okay? It's, it's virtually everything I know unless you have a strict liability tort, um, and even that has its own, its own issues. But you have to prove the, the defendant caused, and that's again your actual, your actual and your proximate cause. And that goes back to whether there were foreseeable intervening events, whether there were criminal acts of the others, of third parties that caused the damages. So you have to take a close look. But don't neglect to discuss causation on your exam. Now, there is a special category for third party witnesses. This is the close family member. So if you, you look on your exam, you spot this, this is big points. The close family a member that witnesses um, an act of intentional infliction of emotional distress and then wants to claim their own damages for witnessing event, the question is can they do that? The general rule is yes. The general rule is if it was a close family member, if they were in close proximity to the act, to the event, if they were actually witnessed and perceived the event, and the defender was aware that they were present. So, you know, if you have a case of um, police brutality or something, beating someone up, a, a, a um, police beating up a kid in front of their mom, and the mom's standing there watching this, and she's suffering all this severe mental and emotional distress caused by these wrongful, let's assume they're wrongful acts of the defendants, she can potentially recover for her own uh, emotional distress. So that's a really big factor if you pick that up. Again, big bonus points. That's what you're looking for. Okay, again, severe. Now, when we're talking severe, you know, these are the things where people will call our office and say, you know, I just had a really, I had a really bad day. Somebody insulted me. Um, they really hurt my feelings. And um, I had a hard time sleeping last night. That's probably not going to be enough for an emotional distress tort. We are talking about extreme, severe, um, types of damages that are beyond that which a reasonable ordinary person should be in, required to tolerate in a civilized society. So these are kind of, kind of the uh, the buzzwords, the language you're going to use. Beyond all dealing with pain, beyond all bounds of decency that a real reasonable person should have to be expected to tolerate. If you have objective evidence of it, that's going to help. If you have um, you're breaking out in a rash, those kinds of things will help. If you have medical records, those will help, those kinds of things. So you want to talk about whether there's objective evidence, and some courts will require that objective evidence. Um, some courts may say mere insults um, are enough. Some may say um, repetitive conduct over and over and over can become severe. So you may have somebody just insulting or bullying somebody day after day after day after day repetition can take an act that may normally not be deemed extreme and outrageous and could actually make it become um, severe and help you with that cause of action. Bruised egos, bruised egos and insults may not be enough. So talk about this on your exam when you see it. Bruised egos, mere insults, some things are protected by the First Amendment, right? So let's not forget that potential First Amendment argument in there. But we want something more than just the common everyday stuff that we're expected to deal with, okay? So we'll be talking about that. So that's our severe. We've got that checked off. Mental and emotional distress. We talked about these. These are all the things that, that can happen to a person when they go through shock and trauma and something outrageous. You know, uh, fear, humiliation, grief, anguish, um, post-traumatic stress disorder is something that's recognized. So these are some things that you want to talk about. Loss of sleep, loss of productivity, uh, the inability to function, um, these kinds of things. So you want to be looking for making a case for your damages, which of course, don't forget to talk about this on your bar exam. I know they don't really hammer it in law school, but it's very important. What are your remedies? What are your remedies when you have some of these things? So you want to be talking about the loss of, the loss of productivity, lost days at work, um, out-of-pocket loss, medical bills, 
um, pain and suffering, punitive damages. So you want to be talking about these kinds of things whenever you're talking about your torts, okay? So that'll take care of all that for us. Um, here's the kicker, the big final kicker. We'll send you off with this. The conduct must be extreme and outrageous. Okay, this is where I think the wheels come off for a lot of people because you'll have all these different things that go on. You have emotional distress, you have intentional conduct, but the big kicker that you have to get over, the big hurdle, 20 foot high wall, is the conduct at issue must be extreme and outrageous. What does that mean? This is known as, once again, as I said from the outset, the tort of outrage. It's got to be something outrageous, something where people would just shout at the top of their lungs, that is crazy! That's nuts! That's atrocious! What are the, what's going on here? That's what you're looking for, something outrageous, okay? And the buzzwords you want to put on your exam, the buzzwords that we put in our legal briefs, is beyond all bounds of decency, beyond all bounds of decency, to which a reasonable member of society is expected to tolerate. So it's beyond all bounds of decency. This is not, you know, your common everyday things and little nudges and pushes and things that drive you nuts. It's got to be something that's extreme and outrageous. This is usually a question of fact for the trier of fact. Make sure you talk about that. Um, there is some discretion that in some cases a judge may have some discretion, but in general we're talking about questions of fact. On your exams, we also want to talk about special plaintiffs, especially vulnerable plaintiffs. There's three generally recognized classes of vulnerable plaintiffs. You have your kids, you have your elders, okay, sometimes triggering also financial elder abuse claims or other elder abuse types of claims, and you have your, your, your pregnant women, kids, and elderly. So you're going to be looking for those. If you see those on your fact patterns, you're going to jump all over it and you're going to go, aha! This could be IIED, the tort of outrage. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to scoop up all my points. And you're going to talk about your, these special protected classes, okay? You're also going to be looking for positions of power, abuses of power, uh, the school principal, the police officer, um, the employer, people that have positions of superiority. Um, these are things that need to be factored in. Also repetition, how many times is this happening? If it's happening two, three, four, five times, something that simple may become the tort of outrage. Okay, so that's something to think about. Finally, you have your common carriers. Don't miss this. Um, I know when you're caught up in the bar exam, you have so many laws and rules and facts in your head, but don't miss the common carrier, the bus driver, the airplane uh, stewardess, the taxi driver, airplanes, trains, automobiles, all that stuff. Somebody does this for a living, the innkeeper, somebody who does this for a living is going to be held to a higher standard, so you may not need to show as much of these other elements where you have common in uh, common carriers and innkeepers. So if you catch that, if you catch these issues, you are nailing it, you're knocking it out of the ballpark, if you need an attorney to handle your emotional distress claim, give us a call. You can find us at askattorneysteve.com. That's askattorneysteve.com. If you need more information about our bar review materials, slaythebar.com. Do we charge you? No, we don't charge you. Everybody else charges you, right? Everybody wants a lot of your money. This is free information. The tort of intentional infliction of emotional distress. Attorney Steve Vondren, thanks for listening. Feel free to share this video on your social media networks. And don't forget to subscribe to our video channel. You want to keep this good stuff coming. Have a great day.